As Angel shared, I am the Vice President of Policy at the Multicultural Media and Telecom Internet Council. It's an organization that has been in DC for the last 35 years, um, advocating and supporting building inclusive um, tech ecosystems um, for various racial and ethnic groups for 35 years. Uh, very connected to the FCC and the world of innovation and technology. So I'm excited because I get to talk with you about one of my favorite things, which is black tech ecosystems. And so let's begin at the very top. The promise of innovation. We see that technology is changing how we experience and live in this new world. We believe that automation will present a 1.1 trillion um, investment in the global economy over the next 10 years. And I think this is a very small number. Um, every city we know is endeavoring to be a smart city. Everyone has a smart city plan. How reliable they are, that's a whole nother discussion, but every city is endeavoring to create one. And NASA has told us that we're heading to Mars by 2033. It just seems like everything is brilliant and dazzling in this new world of innovation. And then on top of that, Biden's 2.3 trillion infrastructure plan is going to revolutionize our infrastructure systems and light rail systems. So it looks good, right? But we have a racial tech disparity problem. Um, everyone in this new innovation economy is not excelling or getting access. You can look at the number of students who have access to computer science um, courses, AP courses in their schools, even though the college board has done great work to increase it through the principles of computer science, but the disparity between black and white students in enrollment and actually taking the test is really dire. You can look at the number of estimated number of STEM degrees that Black and Latino students actually secure. Um, it's only about 20%. You can look at the number of PhDs that we have in the various STEM and, and, and mathematic fields. Um, and you can also extrapolate that to think about like patents and all of those things. And we are behind in that space. Everywhere you look, even when it comes to um, looking at automation and how it would decimate the African-American community who are often located in low-skilled um, jobs that can be easily automated. And so though the world looks brilliant and beautiful for so many, it is some, it presents extreme challenges for Black communities, in particular in the systems, I said systems, of K-12, in the systems of post-secondary, in the systems of looking at attrition retention rates within tech companies and the verticals into entrepreneurship from there, right? And looking at tech startups and government. If you look across these various systems, you would see multiple types of disparities. And then on top of the normal everyday disparities, we have now the black business problem. At the start of the pandemic, we all know that when it comes to venture capital funds, the investment on that is very small. We also know that black um, business owners are least likely to get finance for loans um, from, from our traditional banking systems. And so that's pre-pandemic work. Now that the pandemic has is in its full swing and hopefully on the decline given the number of vaccinations, we realize and we're estimating is that at least 41% of black businesses have closed their doors and many of them struggle to transition um, because the digital divide is still real for black communities where we are estimating at least 38% of black people don't have consistent high speed quality, consistent internet. And so they're having a transition to online um, based to being offline businesses and then, so there are organizations like Black Business Boom and, and Rebrand Cities that are invested in helping Black businesses get online in that way. But what we also then realize is that their pages don't load quickly. Oh my goodness. Um, and Google is very clear about, you know, how they rank pages. And so you, and, and also all of those challenges create a different type of digital compounding, intersecting disparities for Black businesses businesses and black technologists. So if you don't believe me, I love case studies and I love creating my own case studies based on all the interviews I have done. So let's begin by taking um, a young black woman from the rural South and, and she dreams of being the next Mark Zuckerberg, not him himself, but she wants to launch her own tech social media company like Facebook, right? But she's raised within a rural context in the South 
with spotty internet because we have not invested in infrastructure in southern rural counties, right? And she lives in a food desert, meaning that she has to drive at least 20 miles to the nearest grocery store or go to the local Walgreens in order to get um, food for her and her family. And then she goes to a school where she doesn't necessarily have um, computer science courses that would allow her dreams of being, of creating a social media network um, fulfilled. And so you have multiple disparities intersecting the likelihood of this amazingly bright, audacious black child wanting to be that, but not having the broadband, the teachers, right? The access needed to fulfill those dreams. And so they intersect and they compound. Ah, huh, another case study here. Um, young man, it's excited. Clearly he went to the top school, got his engineering, computer science engineering degree. It's working at Facebook, but of course Facebook has some racial, you know, the, the, this hostile environment working there as it relates to being a young black man. So he says, you know something, I'm gonna take this. I'm going to create a type of um, business outside of Facebook that can support their diversity and inclusion issues. So I'm gonna leave that and I'm gonna create my business model, right? But of course, they're not located in the West or in the East Coast, he's somewhere in the Midwest. And so he can't get the type of sub investment dollars that he needs for his new startup. Um, and then he says, well, let me kind of go to a bank. Oh my gosh. They say to him, you have too much student loan debt, right? But he had to get debt, right? To go to school because his family, he was a first generation college student, right? And so he says, well, I really wanted to create this amazing social, enterprise tech business to support DNI efforts at companies, but I guess I have to find another job and be bivocational, right? And build my business on the side as I work for a full-time tech company, never fully realizing and accelerating his dream. I'm sharing these, these case studies because I want you to understand, you say, well, we can fix black business just with investments, no. You have to look at all the intersections that are making it quite difficult for black and brown people to lunch, sustain, and keep their tech businesses, right? Another example, and, and, and we also, we can have a discussion about how companies are becoming tech enabled and everything is tech, every business is tech. We can have that conversation. But this is one of the one that is probably the most pronounced for me. And, and I know several of my colleagues on here, Danielle and Kelly probably hear, they probably hear these a lot with the work that they do. In, in their local ecosystems. And so you have a mom and pop shop and you're um, brick and mortar, right? Pandemic comes, they are one of the top selling soul food restaurants in Nashville, Tennessee. And so the pandemic come, people stop coming. And so they have a young employee or a niece or someone young, some millennial or zennial, right? That says, we can create a website for you. They create the website for their grandmother or auntie who has had this business for 25, 30 years. Um, they create it on Wix. They're excited, but they realize that number one, just because you create a website yet again, doesn't mean that it has SEO, doesn't mean it's optimized. It doesn't mean that it will get the traffic you want immediately on Google or on any other search engine. not trying to just preface Google here. Um, and so there's like, well, fine, this is not working for us. Well, what about that Grubhub family? What does that mean? And so you work to get them connected to these delivery services and you realize that they don't have the type of electronic cash systems that work well for these, for these larger companies. And so you have a 25 year old business who has been a staple within black communities, delivering food, being a, a, a spot for a strong black business that now has to shed its doors because of technology. And so many of you will be like, oh, Dr. Wilson, they could just pick themselves up, have that entrepreneur grit and be able to excel. This is a very toxic ideology. I just want to say it is an extremely toxic ideology to think that you can sojourn through so many disparities, so many um, concrete doors and still be able to have a billion dollar tech startup. It doesn't work that way. And that's a Timberland boot if you didn't know what that was. So this brings me to the larger work that I get to do and the work I care about. I think part of the challenge for the academic community is that we tend to study racial tech disparities and silos. So we tend to look at K through 12 and the challenges there that black and brown students experience, right? Whether it's environmental cues that they belong, stereotype threat, 
all of those variables we look at who's who's taking what computer science classes who doesn't have math all of the achievement data or we tend to look at post-secondary as if you know the prior k-12 matters nothing at, at, at stem and science and, and, and entrepreneurship students that are enrolling, right? We tend to look at everything in silos and not see how they intersect and connect either to create obstacles and sometimes opportunities. You can do a quick search on Google and you will see this easily of what comes up or you know, Google Scholar or any of your database work that we actually have literature on that you can see that this is the case. And so what I propose when we think about how to support and grow amazing black tech businesses and black technologists, because I think for me, they are both equally important. Um, one creates jobs and the other can also create jobs eventually um, once they transition from employee to employer, right? Is to look at ecosystems. Ecosystems are amazing things, right? It shows how systems work together and they feed off of each other to create either a hospitable environment or a not hospitable environment. And so when you look at the systems of K through 12, post secondary, entrepreneurship, um, government, government, right? Um, and tech companies, hello, oh, sorry, okay. And tech companies, you realize that these are all different systems within a larger tech ecosystem in a city and that we have to figure out a research framework that allows us to capture exactly what are the lived experiences of black technologists and black tech founders in these spaces and of course ecosystem literature is probably definitely in the in the physical sciences and they go deep there and i know in entrepreneurship we have some of those same types of variables when we talk about density and location and all those types of things but i really am talking about both entrepreneurship but all the other external environmental variables that affect the ability to launch, sustain, grow, scale, exit a tech business for Black people. And so develop the Black tech ecosystem assessment. And so we looked at all of the literature we could find that talked about this in some way, in some form or fashion. Of course, the K-12 literature is very deep in this space. Um, and looked at K-4 models, like you take pipeline and develop a type of indexing system to really look at how do you show compounding or opportunities created by these various intersecting um, systems within a city's tech ecosystem or within specifically a black tech ecosystem. And so these are some of the variables that we're looking at. And this model is intransient because there's an additional piece that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes that's not featured here, that I really wanna talk about black tech anchor institutions as variables within this larger model that we have built. But we believe that this is, 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 is a first step to really trying to pull together all the variables that can either excel um, or restrict mobility of, of black business development or black tech pipeline development. So those are some of the, oper we operationalize them. And then of course, once we do that in the indexing, we score and we use the national equities um, project lens systems of oppression um, based on the results uh, because we want to make it actionable for cities to really understand how to address it. And this model will, be, will helps us to, to do that a little bit better. For instance, with some of the cities that we have worked with, we looked at like community colleges, so post-secondary. We looked at community colleges, two-year institutions, also traditional four-year institutions. And one of our measures was about, you know, diverse funding for research in this space. And who is the most likely to fund these things is the National Science Foundation. And so we looked at their funding of, of these institutions within cities, and we realized that community colleges in particular, where they had the largest number of African American students, were least likely to get funding from NSF to do any work around STEM pipeline development or anything around STEM inclusion and entrepreneurship, right? And, 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 and that's a problem because many of the universities were private universities that got National Science Foundation dollars, right? And they actually have, they vary between two to 8% black people enrolled in those institutions, right? And so one of our actionable strategies using this in the lens of oppression, we saw that because it was happening across institutions, secondary um, institutions, um, predominantly four-year institutions and community colleges that presented an opportunity for some type of cross collaboration between these between these institutions to work together 
because community colleges have the students, the talent, right? And clearly the larger universities have the NSF grants and that there has to be some type of relationship there for a city to, to align around how to do this effectively. And so part one of my discussion, because I know my time is probably coming up, was to really lay the groundwork for how we should think about um, growing Black tech entrepreneurship and Black tech pipelines through understanding an ecosystem of effects, right? But the second part of it is really looking at who are the leaders that help us understand this assessment tool? I know many of us in, at the city level, we look to Brookings and other national organizations to come into our cities and to say, this is how you solve economic issues. This is how you solve the business issue. This is how you create a plan. But I would venture to say that the true source that can help you to understand what's happening in your city are local black tech ecosystem builders. One of the things I can say with the work we have done and the work I've done over the last couple of years is that across this country, there are, and also not just African-American, but other racial and ethnic communities who have decided because of the challenges of raising venture, right? Of the challenges of trying to figure out um, dollars for STEM, of all the challenges around digital inclusion and access that they experience with their own business development, they said, well, we'll create a nonprofit that will help us navigate the intersecting ecosystems, right? So that black and brown people can grow their tech businesses and grow the skills needed to be competitive in a tech pipeline market. And so they are the ones that are, that are doing this for cities, but cities don't see them primarily because they don't think that they have the talent in house. Um, but we are building a database to help cities to be able to identify those amazing people within their cities. Um, and below, you'll see a picture, actually one of our presenters later, Joshua Edmonds from Detroit. Kelly is the founder of VIA. Um, and Danielle is the founder of Black Business Boom, which has been doing tremendous work to get Black um, businesses online over the pandemic. And she deserves a round clap for all the work she's done. Okay, and so you should, so cities should look to talk to them about this assessment work. The second piece of it is, is looking not only at the individuals, but the institutions within Black communities that can help understand, number one, the challenges, but also our solutions to the challenges. Historically, Black colleges and universities, African-American churches, and others operate what I'm terming in a paper as tech anchor institutions within cities. They are places where you have large congregations of people, money, talent. I often tell people, people forget about African-American churches, but before there was true, um, before there was the end of racial oppression for black people, black churches and black universities, HBCUs were the only places where we could go. So it wasn't just that they were sites for um, your spiritual transformation, they were actually sites for skill development, right? They were sites for education, and matter of fact, the reason why we have historically black colleges and universities is because black churches funded them, created them, right? And so they play really strong, they have played a historically a strong role in skill development and business development. Why do we have black credit unions? Black churches invested in them. It's the whole history behind it that we forget. And they also play now a significant role in the work that we could do to promote um, and in some of the challenges because of the pandemic for black tech businesses. Because I tell people all the time, these two institutions in particular, they have people, they have land, they have talent, and they have money, right? And if we could figure out how to harness them better within cities and teach them about this new world, um, they can really help with some of the challenges uh, that the pandemic in particular has wrought, but also as a, as a way to move forward. <laughs> And so these are some of the tech anchor institutions that we should be looking at as we think about how to stabilize our, our Black economies within cities to support the development of Black tech business owners and also of Black technologists. <laughs> Lastly, very quickly, what should government do? Number one, local government should once again work with local Black tech ecosystem builders to develop inclusive smart city plans um, that really get at both inclusion, supplier diversity, right? For many IoT um, items that are coming out of smart cities and also to make sure that that, that is equitable. 
state government, they should also make investments into these tech anchor institutions, right? Um, to support the development of pipeline and black tech businesses. At the federal level where I find myself and I think I see some of my amazing partners on here, um, is that it would be amazing if all the monies that are going toward broadband mapping that the FCC and the NTI are working on could really begin thinking about using some of those fundings for communities of color, but in the case of my presentation, Black tech communities and do assessments, right? Understand how people use the internet. What do they think of the internet? We don't have enough Adam Tunnel to, what do they think of SEO? Do they even know what an SEO is to build a business? How do they? We don't have the, those types of data sets that would, I think that the federal government could help us build. And lastly, if you wanna know more about the great work, just reach out to me. Thank you.